So our last speaker for this section is uh, Ben Gertzel. He's the director of research for the Singularity Institute and CEO of Novamente. Ben. What I'm going to talk to you about is OpenCog, which is an open source platform for creating beneficial artificial general intelligence. Uh, you can't accuse us of setting our ambitions too low. What, what we're after is creating an AI which can think at, at the human level and ultimately uh, beyond there in, in a variety of uh, directions that, that are going to be really interesting to see. So it's a, it's a hard problem fostering the development of advanced beneficial AGI. And I'm only going to be able to sort of hint at the uh, types of solutions that, that we think we have. There's really two obstacles to achieving this goal. There's technical obstacles. How do you build the thinking machine? How, how do you design the code? How do you write the code? What hardware does it run on? Then there's practical obstacles. How, how, do you, how do you get the resources, the human resources, the financial resources to put something like this together? Most of the talk is going to focus on the, the technical plan. I'll just say a few moments about the practical aspects first. I mean, there's, there's a number of avenues in our society for gathering resources to do something like this. And in the 20 years of my career, I've, I've had experience with academia, industry, with the government. And I've recently come to the conclusion that probably the best way to move forward toward really advanced artificial general intelligence is the open source software development methodology. But I, I'd hasten to add, this is not in contradiction to working with industry, academia, and, and government. Rather, it, it's a way of sort of directing and, and marshalling the, the resources of these institutions. And uh, my own AI company, Novamente, is doing a mix of open source development and proprietary software development. One of the reasons I think the open source development process is so appropriate here is that initially, an artificial general intelligence system may not do anything very useful. I mean, I've I have three children. One of them is now 18. He's a junior in college. And he, he knows a lot now. But I can tell you, all three of them, when they were first born, were just completely useless. I mean, they, <laughs> they, they lay there. They scream. They made huge, just disgusting messes all over the place. I mean, they're, they're, they're hopeless. And if, if you didn't know what they were going to go into, you'd just throw them in the garbage. And there's... <laughs> To an extent, I think we can expect that AI systems are going to be the same way. There's no way to expect that the early stages of an advanced AGI system is going to do a lot of good. And that, that plays oddly with the profit motive of industry and with the, the publication motive of, of academia. And I think the open source development methodology has, has more flexibility to it that can sort of embrace this developmental aspects of general intelligence. There's a lot of approaches getting to the technical side, there's a lot of approaches to building an AGI system. Um, I listed four on here, but actually in Eric Baum's talk, we heard some others. We, he, he mentioned the possibility of evolving AIs by simulating evolution, and then his, his own approach of sort of combining an evolutionary sort of thing with a computer aid design system that lets you encode your introspective intuitions. And these are all cool approaches. The, the last talk that we heard was about brain emulation, which it's definitely going to work eventually. It has the problem now that we don't really know enough about how the human brain works in detail to make a simulated brain that, that, can, that can really think, but I'm sure that will come as, as brain scanning technology develops. We have mathematical theory of intelligence, which is really interesting and close to my heart. I'm a math PhD originally, which again may get us there eventually, but isn't yet to the level where we can prove theorems about the questions that are really Im important for building thinking machines. This is what I call narrow AI, using AI programs to do practical stuff like play chess, predict financial markets, although we've seen some mistakes in the financial prediction AIs lately, uh, control robots, control virtual AIs and games, detect credit card fraud, all these narrow AI programs, Google for that matter, all these narrow AI programs around us, there's a possibility they can just through natural progress adopt more and more general intelligence as time goes on. Then in the, in the lower corner, there's the approach that I think is most promising, which I call an integrative approach, where we try to pull together stuff that we know about the brain, mathematical knowledge, tricks learned in building narrow AI systems, pull these all together into an integrative software system focused on general intelligence. 
this idea of directly attempting to achieve general intelligence has kind of had a bad name in the academic AI field for the last couple decades, although it is where the AI field started out with back in the, in the 50s and 60s. But the tide is starting to turn a, a little bit. You're seeing more conferences, symposia, and workshops and so forth aimed at the more uh, ambitious aspects of, of AI work. And as, as part of that, this March, I helped organize a conference called AGI 08, which was at the University of Memphis. And we had around 100 people there, a lot of AI researchers just talking technical stuff about how to make thinking machines. And we're doing another similar conference march in uh, D.C., second conference on uh, AGI. So you're all, you're all welcome to go, go to the website and uh, register. We hope to, hope to see you there. The rest of my talk, I'll tell you a little bit about OpenCog itself. And it, th there's a lot to tell. It'll naturally be kind of sketchy. If, if anyone is uh, interested on the technical side, but we're actually doing a, an all-day workshop on OpenCog tomorrow, which you, you can find out about. So there's, there's two aspects to OpenCog. One is what I call the OpenCog framework, which you could think of as a sort of operating system for, for general intelligence. Every aspect of an operating system on a computer is there in OpenCog, but instead of being concerned with running general software processes, we're concerned with running cognitive processes and having them interact with each other. Then on top of the framework, there's a specific general intelligence design called OpenCog Prime. And if you look at opencog.org, there's a 250-page wiki book there, which uh, I'll publish as, as a regular paper book eventually. And this goes through in detail how we think you've got to do the computer science and software implementation to make a thinking machine with, with human-level intelligence. And of course, of course, there's gaps. There's plenty of subsidiary computer science problems to be solved there, as, as well as implementation problems. And we're, we're working through them as, as, as best we can. Just to give a little bit of an idea of some of the things inside the OpenCog design before I go to some practical examples. This, this slide shows one of the knowledge representation schemes inside the system, which stores declarative knowledge using nodes and links and representing knowledge as kind of patterns of arrangement among the nodes and links. It's kind of a higher level than the, the neural networks that we saw in the last talk, but with, with, with some, some similarities. On that table of nodes and links, you have a number of cognitive processes acting, and this is where we go a bit further from the brain metaphor. We use probabilistic logic, evolutionary learning, simulation of the world, heuristics for creating new concepts, and a bunch of other stuff acting together on this knowledge repository. How does, how does it do anything? We have modules that generate behaviors, modules that process perceptual data, feed them into the cognitive system with its nodes and links, and then you feed out actions and behaviors. I showed a robot on this slide. It doesn't have to be a physical robot, although we are doing some stuff like that. It can be a virtual agent living in a virtual world. It can be a, a chatbot. There's a lot of different things you can do with the same architecture. And that box that says cognition engine there explodes out into the atom table of nodes and links, all these cognitive processes, language understanding, and a whole bunch of stuff. What we feel in, inside our own minds, our, our reflective awareness, our, our, our self, our, our feeling of will that we're charting our path through the world, how does that com come out of all this? I tried to address this in a book I wrote in 2006 called The Hidden Pattern, and that would be a lot to go into here, but one thing I think is important to stress is like there's, there's no self-node inside the system. There's not a free will node. There's not an awareness module that someone typed in in C++. I, I view these kinds, of, these kinds of higher level properties of mind as emergent properties that come out of the coordinated activity of a lot of different parts of the system working together, and that, that can sound kind of airy-fairy, but w when, you, when you work through the details, it actually does, does come out to, to make sense. What do we want to do with this system? One thing you can do is, is talk to it, and this is not our system. This is AliceBot, which is a standard variety chatbot, which along with all the other chatbots out there has the property that it has no idea what it's talking about. I mean, they just try to work around the fact they have no idea what they're talking about with clever tricks and, and diversions. And we would like to use OpenCog to make a chatbot that actually talks with, with some sentience and, and understanding. Other things you can do are control agents in uh, virtual worlds. I think it, making a virtual parrot that talks is, would be pretty interesting and a kind of cool way to teach language, teach language to a system. Controlling physical robots, we're collaborating with, with a university in, the, in China, in, in Xiamen, on using OpenCog to control a little humanoid guy about, about this big. And one of the applications I'm most excited about a little further down the road is using AI systems to help us, help us do science better. And 
just to see, see the need for that, I took a, a, a few screenshots of, of PubMed. So this is an online repository of biomedical research papers. If you, if you just, I searched for apoptosis, which is pre-programmed cell death, 150,000 papers. P53, which is a particular gene, 50,000 papers. No one can read all those papers, but an AI could read all those papers. So there, there's, there's an awful lot of potential for AIs to help us do science better and better. We may start out very simple with virtual babies that just lie there and go goo 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 and don't do anything. At least they don't mess up your house, they're just in the computer. But I think that there's a lot of more practical applications that can happen down the road. And actually, I'm going to talk for the next few minutes about the specific stuff we're doing with, with OpenCog right now. One of them is even more low level than virtual babies. We're playing with virtual dogs. So virtual dogs in an online virtual world that you teach tricks. And you teach them by imitation and by reinforcement. They can play with each other. The dogs have different emotions, pride, anger, happiness, and so forth. They, they have physiological indicators. They, 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 want, they want to get food. They, they, they want to have fun playing with each other. And uh, This is a... That's too loud. All right. I don't know what use the sound is at all, but this, 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 sh this shows a virtual dog being taught a fairly simple behavior. Wh what it's trying to learn is that when this girl here kicks this leg, it's supposed to do one dance. When the girl kicks the other leg, it's supposed to do the other dance. It learns that by watching this girl. So she, she's giving the dog examples to, to imitate. The dog's supposed to learn, okay, when she kicks right leg, make that stupid dance. When she kicks left leg, do that stupid dance. And the, the text down here is basically control commands to the dog, like, okay, you're supposed to be learning now. You're, spo you're supposed to be watching now. And talk about program learning, like Eric talked about in, in, his, in his talk. Essentially, the dog is learning a little program, a compact program, which can explain the, the behaviors that, that, that it's seeing. So this Occam razor stuff we talked about it is very concrete here. We specifically have an Occam's razor bias in, in the program learning algorithm. And, see, has it learned it yet? Uh, no, now it's just being an idiot. It, whatever program it's running, it's probably very compact, but it's causing it to just sit there. So it's not, it's, it's not, not, dis not displaying the desired behavior. So. So it's going to get kicked in the head. Bad, bad, bad boy. All right. Fido's a bad boy. Right. So now, okay, he's, he's trying again. I think he's doing a better job. Yeah, he's... Right. So that, that's better than my dog can do. I mean, Basically, it, it, it learned it's supposed to copy what, what, what she's doing, and it, it has some prior knowledge. So it knows like it knows its leg corresponds to her leg. So when she steps forward, if it wants to copy that, it should step forward and so forth. But it has to learn what combination of movements will imitate imitate what what it what it saw. And I'm I'm short in time. I wonder if I can skip the rest of this. No, did I just kill myself? No. Okay. So. So that, 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 that's one thing we're doing, which, which is, is pretty cool, and it's aimed at just starting from the beginning. Basic perception, action, learning based on what you see from imitation and movement. We're also doing some higher level stuff. One of the things is language processing. Totally different direction, but how do you translate English into logical nodes and links? And th there's a number of stages. So you start with a, start with a sentence and turn it into a syntactic representation. So you have, I've gone to eat dinner with Bob, a simple sentence. And you do some parsing, you turn into some syntactic nodes and links, and the links are labeled with, with parts of speech. Then we have another stage, we turn those syntactic nodes and links into semantic ones. We get subjects, to, with relationships. Finally, some more AI is done, you turn those semantic nodes and links into abstract logic. Finally, we've turned I go eat dinner with Bob into something about, okay, Bob is the ingester, dinner is ingestible, I am also an ingester and so forth. And once we have these nodes and links in the knowledge base, then you can reason on them. You can do a lot of different things with them. I mean, the, this kind of stuff is used to help the dogs understand these very simple sentences like, let's play scavenger hunt. This is the treasure. Go find the treasure. But obviously also you can do a lot more stuff with this kind of language under, understanding software. And the, the last thing I want to talk about is artificial reasoning. We have a probabilistic logic module in OpenCog which reasons on this network of, of nodes and links. And the, the math of that is in a book called Probabilistic Logic Networks 
which should appear from the spring of Verlag uh, this, this month, I guess. They've been promising it for a while. But I'll just show some very simple examples of it here. Obviously, this, this picture doesn't tell you too much, but th those are nodes and links which are in the memory of an actual running OpenCog instance. And the next slide, we see a few more nodes and links, a few more links. The links in green are links that were learned by the reasoning system based on the existing links in the system. And what we did here was just a simple example of trying to use OpenCog's reasoning module to learn associations between concepts. So the, the gray links are associations that were learned by OpenCog's language processing module. We fed it a bunch of text, not that much, but a bunch of Wikipedia articles, and it learns, okay, these concepts are associated with these other concepts. But it's not all that much text, so it couldn't learn everything. We say, okay, based on extrapolating from those associations, what new associations can you guess? So here it guessed the association between leader and shepherd based on putting together the pieces from other ones. And here's a little more interesting example. You can see it, it guesses the association between foreign and administration. Why? First it had to guess official is related to administration. Then it had to guess foreign is related to administration by putting that together with foreign is related to official. And of course, that, that's a really simple example, which doesn't stress most parts of the reasoning system, but it illustrates the idea that you can get some links in your knowledge base from the outside world, and then you learn new links in your knowledge base through reasoning, which of course is a much more generic and, uh, and thoroughgoing process than that. So we're, we're working in a number of different directions, training virtual animals, processing language into logic, doing reasoning to generate new knowledge, and more stuff that I haven't had time to talk about. All these are within the common open cog framework, which we think of as, as a kind of mind OS, and we have an overall design, the OpenCog open Prime design, which all these pieces can fit together into, hopefully, if everything works out, leading us toward an advanced AI system. So I'll, I'll close with a, a picture of the, the ladder of ascending intelligence. And uh, we're starting off pretty simple, virtual animals, virtual dogs that can learn new tricks, virtual parrots that we can teach by talking to them, hopefully ar artificial babies that can learn to interact in the world and develop much as human babies do. We skipped a few steps in between, but eventually artificial scientists that can help us penetrate the morass of research papers and, and data that we're gathering now and automatically control our laboratory instruments. And what comes next? Who, who knows, really? There's a lot of possibilities. One. One possibility, brain-computer interfacing, we can do intelligence augmentation al along with AI. I, th I think Weird Al Yankovic could use some, but it's just a personal opinion. And what, what, what comes beyond there? I mean, who knows? I mean, there, there's all sorts of forms of, of possible intelligence in the world. And by the time we get to that level, there may be none of the code or ideas in, in OpenCog left, for, for, for that matter. But uh, I think this is, this is about the most exciting and important thing that, that I know of. I mean, it's very important to do this carefully and, and thoughtfully. There are a lot of danger involved and there, there's a lot of incredible benefits involved and we're, we're committing to progressing with this safely, thoughtfully and, and beneficially to help bring about the singularity along with all these other great technologies being developed. Do I have time like to take questions? a question? Yeah, take, we'll take one question. All right, question. Um, this reminds me a lot of um, Doug Lennett's psych projects. I wonder if you could just talk about either the similarities or differences between this and uh, what he tried to do. Well, psych has no embodiment one and question. no learning, which are significant differences. Psych is founded on hand coding of knowledge, whereas our system is founded on learning knowledge through experience, which is a, a fairly substantial difference. Okay, yeah. Ben, we're going to have to oh, that's it? wrap up. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ben.